could that be? Let's see. This is how you answer a door. Geek Saga. Who is it? Hey guys. Hey, what's going hey. on? Welcome to the show, Evil Ted Smith of the Evil Ted channel. What's going on, Ted? Really good. I really quickly. Uh, this is are we are, we don't we're not live with the oh, general. We're live. Audience. We, we are, are live. live. So people yeah. can people people can chat and ask questions. Oh yeah, yeah. definitely. Because yeah, because I was directing people, I kept thinking, is this being recorded? So I know, just double check it. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> guys. Hello, everybody. Hi, I'm Evil Ted. How you doing? All right, and we got your first person that's chiming in there. Who is Evil Ted? I've been so many of his Twitch streams in the past. <laughs> oh, it's Danny Knight. I know Danny Knight. How you doing, man? Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome to the YouTube live stream here over at Geek Saga. <clears throat> okay, well, guys. Really quickly, <clears throat> yeah, really quickly uh, to answer your question, uh, I've been uh, I've been in the industry almost over thirty years. Thirty years. Um, okay. Yeah, I started when I was um, nineteen eighty nine. Uh, I was about. 24 25 wow. i moved up to i moved up yeah i was a kid and i moved out to california and hit the ground running i came out in the early days of the um the 90s when it was still almost a little residual from the 80s when they had like the straight to video market so there was just so much work when i came out at the time like people would write to me hey ted what you know what can i do to work in the industry so i can tell you what i did in the 90s like <laughs> like it's 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 so different now yeah it's crazy yeah, yeah that's what i got sorry well i mean the, your list of projects that i've like i'm looking at at what's on your website because i've also gone to your website I, I mean i've tried finding everything i can and the one that actually piqued the interest of my good friend there david is guyver yeah like, oh, really so that was something he was like, oh, I, I'm in. Yeah, bring him on the show. Let's talk to Let's him. Let's do this. Well, <laughs> well the, the, the thing with the guy, the guy was a big turning point for me in my career because when I came out here, I met um, uh, I met some guys. I worked on Tales from the Dark Side, the movie. It it came and left. It was it was really, it was a TV series. And of course, they made a movie. Oh, yeah. It was a great movie. TV series. I loved oh, it. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, so the movie had different segments of it. I always worked on the, uh, the Gargoyle episode. And this was back in the days when it was more sort of CG. So all the shots of New York and look, there's a shot of the movie where the camera comes inside this guy's studio apartment and they're in New York and they, come, they look through the window, like over the uh, the glass ceiling window. And it's all done visual effects. It's all miniatures. We built the miniatures and there was a, a screen behind it. And they're projecting the image underneath on the glass. That was a big motion control shot. And so there's a guy sculpting gargoyles for the movie. And it was Steve Wang. For you guys out there, Steve Wang's this huge makeup artist. So we became friends. And uh, Steve did like the Predator monster. He did uh, the Gill Man from uh, Monster Squad. And so he's recognized a phenomenal artist. So he was making a low budget film. And I came on board to help him. I just like totally, we totally hit it off. And so he made his low budget movie called Kung Fu Rascals. We became friends. And then he and Screaming Red George got the rights and got funding to do Guyver the movie. And I was there for ground zero. So I was able to um, be part of the show. I was, um, I was originally, um, uh, my big, big claim to fame was I got to build and design the Guyver unit. So the guy yeah. you see in the movie was my design. I built it. Steve built the suits. So I kind of modeled up to him and there's a gag where it opens up. I did all that. And I played not one, but two monsters, in the movie. Yeah, oh, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I played Striker, the big lizard by JJ Walker. I played I played his monster counterpart. Uh -huh. So I was the creature. And uh, for all you kids out there, if you guys want to see all this stuff, you go to eviltedsmith.com and have my website. There's all the pictures I posted. There's a uh, um, there's a, a folder called Monsters I Played. <clears throat> if you go to that, you can see all the pictures. But anyway, um, so and I played that monster, and at the very end of the scene, Mark Hamill in the movie played this character called Bax, and he transforms into a monster and i played the monster we i was in that costume forever but we had this whole big thing planned like this big fight scene and like any low budget movie we just ran out of time so it's like i transform and then i die like it was <laughs> yeah i think it's like two minutes or three minutes of on-screen time as him as a creature and then right. he's like he's dying on scene and then he just yeah. kind of like 
Because we Croak. just ran. Oh, there, yeah, there it is. There's striker, MC striker. That's it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was. Um, and so I did that, and that just kind of launched me by doing that film with him. I met so many amazing, uh, amazing visual effects people. Oh my god, that was from a video game. Uh, I was well, you know, back in the the days when CD ROM came out. Oh, yep. CD ROM games, and everybody thought it was going to be the next big wave, and they just tanked so fast. <laughs> and um, so this was a test for a CD ROM, uh, CD ROM game called Monster Mash, and the concept of the game is that you're a giant robot and you're a pilot and you're fighting the giant. And as you're playing the game, there's a, a scientist in a jeep driving around trying to give you instructions to how to operate the robot as you're fighting. So I played the monster and it was me in a costume and they hit me into a building and set pyro and I was engulfed in flames. Oh, and, wow. Uh, luckily I didn't burn, but it was like, it's a great shot. Jesus. Yeah. So to, like I looked over your, the list of stuff that you've done and I have to say. Yep. He's gone. He lost wow. You know what happened? He, he did what I do. I, he clicked the wrong switch. It happens all the time. He probably did, yeah. He'll be right oh, back. Yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, but, yep. um, uh, yes. There there we go. Sorry. <laughs> I hit my stupid mouse, and, and Dennis will attest to that. I hate this mouse now. He was but like, he probably hit the wrong button. <laughs> I did. I hit the, there's a side button on here. So, so, your okay. question. so the list of stuff that you have here, and this is why David always says, you watch pretty much everything. I have watched every single movie that is on your list. There is not one thing that I have missed. Oh my goodness. And, wow. That's yeah. And that's, that's why I, when I was <laughs> able to get you on the show, I was like, Oh my God, this is awesome. Because even with your TV shows, Xena obviously was a huge thing because when I was younger, she was hot. She still is. <laughs> she still is. She looks amazing. Yeah. Um, then VR troopers, of course, was a show that was coming on <laughs> when we would get home from school. Um, yeah. The Arrested Development, I still watch that to this day. And my wife was impressed that she's like, Oh my god, he, he worked on Arrested Development? I said, Yes. <clears throat> Walking Dead, which is ultimately one of my favorite shows. And the, I mean, the, I can go on and on about all this stuff that's on here, but I've literally watched everything that's on here. And mm. I'm well, I can tell you here's the on Xena, I had a little bit more involvement on Xena because I worked at a company called K and B FX Group. And we, they built this giant monster, and I had to go outside. I had to go out uh, uh, to New Zealand to babysit it. And my job was to adjust the actor, get him in and out of the suit, make sure everything was working. And um, <clears throat> so I was on set, and they sh I was really impressed on how fast they shot that show because it was a television schedule. And uh, I, I met Lucy Lawless. That was um, a blast to meet her on that show. And I was out there for almost about three months on that production. So that was a bigger involvement on that show. And um, – but on the stuff like uh, Walking Dead and Rest Development, I was at a prop house. So my job is I sat at a, at a desk and they would just come in every day and go, oh, we need this, buy this and this. And this. So half the time I'd make something I didn't even know what it was for. And for Arrested Development, um, the, it was a TV show and they shoot things fast. Um, a cinder block. There's a big gag where a cinder block falls and hits one of the guys in the head. And they're like, my the shop I was working at had this mold that was rotting, it was falling apart. Like, oh my god, we need this cinder block by tomorrow. I was like, I can fabricate that out of foam. They're like, right. what? And so I did. I, I fabricated a cinder block. I think it's on my website too. On props I made. I, I think foam props. But yeah, I I ended up doing it in a day. I got yeah. sheet foam, I cut it, I glued it, and we covered it with rubber latex and painted it and literally did it in 24 hours. I did it like in well, I had an eight hour day. So we did it. It was a one day wonder. And so I would do stuff like that. Uh, we did Alias, the TV show, Malcolm in the Middle. We did so much stuff, just crazy weird things. The turnaround was insane. It was just so fast all the time. We, we had like a day or two days to make something all the time. It's crazy. Ah, oh, that's great. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm, and I'm looking at your, <laughs> I'm looking at the phone props that you made. And, but I mean, well, honestly, I've looked at all your stuff that you've built <laughs> on your Instagram. Again, I'm the one that's fanboying out here. And Dennis, <laughs> he knows how. when I start to get fanboyish, it's like, sometimes I'll just go off and yeah, mm. I, I lose my train of thought, but is um, there anything, anything particular of, of all the shows and everything you guys have seen? Is there something that stands out or something out of those films? Anything you guys wanted to know? Or So I wanted to know, actually, my daughter asked me 
if on The Walking Dead, yes, it mentioned that you you they used your technique on making the the swords, the machetes, the axes. Did you work on like Michonne swords and really? on the axe, the axe yeah. which Rick used? Uh, no, here's the thing. We did. I my biggest claim to fame for Walking Dead was we had to do the swords. They got the swords and they um we had several swords. We had aluminum, so we had we had two lightweight aluminums, lightweight aluminums, uh, and then we had real ones. I don't know why they needed one, but we had metal ones and we had aluminum ones. And my usually we mold and cast them, but my boss was like, "No, I want every handle wrapped with white leather." So I had to I had to mimic the Japanese like the wrapping on the handles. So we did these. Yeah, yeah, it was a pain in the ass. So we had to strip them all down, and I, and I, I basically by the time I got to the third one, I got it down pretty well but i was wrapping these handles with the white leather and the cool thing about the show was that we made half swords and the swords were half they were a basically a handle with half a blade and the blade only went out so far and what they did this is again this is the early days well <clears throat> we've come along such a far away from the time that show people don't realize walking dead now it's, it's an old show yeah but, but they were still there the digital thing was happening pretty fast and they were catching up with it so they would have Michonne take guys' heads off in, in camera in one shot. These guys would walk up. She'd take her sword and go, whoosh, whoosh. And what it was, she had the half sword. And so she was taking the half sword and swinging it in front of the actors. And the guys in post could take that blade and build the rest digitally. So the blade could go through the neck and they would digitally grab the guys' heads uh, with the actors. And, and they would just act like their heads are coming off. And they, they would impose, take the heads and lift them off their bodies and make them look like they're falling. And they would do it in, they would do it on, and post. They would just go in and do it. And if you watch the show, it's, it, it goes, it's beautiful. It's like, whack, it looks seamless. And it's, yeah. it's, it's groundbreaking. Like, the, cause I come from the old school day effects of somebody's getting their head cut off. You have to cut in for a close up. You right. have hands, you got a fake puppet head thing and the heads comes off and you do a close up. Then you go to a wide shot. The guy's got his head hid. And he drops the ground really quick, he, and it, it, it completes the gag. You do it in a series of shots. Now, Walking Dead, it's like television. She just goes whack. The guy's walking. Next thing you know, his head's gone, and he drops and hits the ground. The shots are short because if you stay on too long, it's it's more work. So the the effects still works, but it's again that was back then, and they were they were mastering this technology. So we're like now you're watching stuff like Mando. And stuff. It's just like it's what they can do now digitally. It's just groundbreaking. And it has changed the uh, industry drastically. Oh, yeah. But but that was what that was my big thing. It was, it was kind of fun to work on that and to realize how they did it, what we were doing. And so we gave them practical props to actually complete this gag they were doing. That's pretty <clears throat> awesome. That is awesome. So we before we actually came on camera, we were talking, or actually on to the start of the show, we were talking about how uh, back in the day, the the whole when you grew up, yes, there wasn't what we have now as far as oh, like no. the conventions the all that stuff so what was the big show for you that actually got you into wanting to do this stuff and what basically solidified that you you truly are a geek like uh, what well, I, I think it's was a kid i i loved everything sci-fi growing up here's the thing what i date myself on because when i was growing up and i held this title for a long time um all the way into my 20s and my early 30s, you name anything sci-fi, I've seen it. There's, We're talking Japanese, Soviet movies, whatever you make. Anything sci-fi was my quest to see it. Because people don't realize this, guys. I'm going to tell all you kids out there. Sci-fi was a, it was a very small genre. It was a lot. There was films out there, but it wasn't the abundance it is now. So as a kid growing up from the, from the 60s and 70s and the 80s, anything sci-fi came out, we jumped on board. And, it, and even though it was bad, you were kind of like, eh, well, you know, you, you watched it anyway because it was the only thing you could get. Um, <clears throat> I was I was moved by uh, Day the Earth Stood Still. When I was a mm. kid, I saw that movie that blew me away. Uh, I loved that one a lot. And then I loved Forbidden Planet, oh. which was the original. If you get any kids yeah. out there, you guys, that was, a, it's, was shot in color. And that was in the 50s. And at that time, it was such a gamble because they were spending a million dollars on one movie and that was forbidden planet and it was a big deal and they, they're like oh my god we're spending a million dollars it was it was it was it was a huge success when it came out too but um 
yeah, that those movies kind of got me excited. But I was very, very young. There wasn't much I could do about it, but except watch them and and, and love them. But it was a, the turning point. I was 14 years old in 1977. Star Wars came out. And, and like, again, for youngsters out there, um, <laughs> when that movie came out, we saw something on screen we'd never seen before because there was effects, but nothing to that level. And George Lucas wanted stuff that didn't exist. So he created his own effects company called ILM. So when we all went to the theater in the 70, 1977 and we sat there, there was a giant spaceship that flew over our heads and we lost our minds. It's like, holy crap, you couldn't, you, you, you couldn't comprehend how you, like, oh my God, how'd you do that? And you just see this stuff and shoots and guys and lasers. And it was like fun and action packed and was swashbuckling like Buck Rogers. And so, yeah, it changed my life. And so that's when I realized I want to make stuff. And there was no YouTube channel or books. So I was in the Midwest and I would like, how do they make this stuff? You know, they just just make it. That, that was always people's, I don't know, they just make it. I'm like, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks. In other words, you have no idea what you're talking about. Just say that. Yeah. Say, yeah. Say, how would you say, I don't know? How about that? Just say that. Oh, no. so, yeah. You can't say that. <laughs> so, so if I'm wrong, Ted, so your first build was Darth Vader, right? It was, yeah, I was, I built stuff prior. I built like spaceships and things. Okay. But then when I saw Darth Vader, I'm like, I wonder, like, uh, and I never forget when I was a kid, I was so frustrated because I made his face out of uh, cardboard and post because his face was very geometrical. But when I got to the helmet, it was paper mache. And no matter how good you are at paper mache, it's never smooth. It drove me nuts. I, I, I would always, and my parents were all wild by it. I was like, ah, it's not smooth. I, it doesn't look right. You just kept striving to do stuff and making things. And I would just find... And so I would, I did what most prop makers did in the 70s and 80s. I would just find stuff and fabricate them together. And like, and of course, when Star Wars came out, every water gun got spray painted black. Everything was black, of black, course. black with with dry brush silver paint. Every gun, every like, if you do that now, you get shot. But when, yeah. we were kids, when I was a kid, just like that's all we did. We'd get toy guns and stick stuff on them and spray paint them black. But yeah, that was a movie that that. That kind of woke me up, but again, for all you, uh, there was no. Um, we all got made fun of. Uh, I was a big sci-fi fan. I loved Star Trek as a kid. Grew up on seventies television. We had uh, Space nineteen ninety nine and Star Trek and all the stuff we watched. But then Star Wars was the whole, the whole dirty sci-fi, the dirty spaceships and the waste and the, like the, the kind looked, of ground. Yeah, it yeah. looked lived. Yeah, it yeah, looked it looked gritty and yeah, yeah. And that was the, that was the big groundbreaker. George Lucas was the first one to do that. And so everything prior to sci-fi was always pristine and clean, like 2001, Space 1999, Star Trek, uh, even um, uh, Logan even Buck Run. Rogers. Yeah, Buck Rogers, Logan's Run. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and it was so funny. Even Buck Rogers was like a, was a cash cow because Star Wars came out. So everybody's like, oh, we got we got to jump on and Battlestar Galactica. Oh, okay. all, everybody, it, was a it was everybody just everybody tried to. It went from nobody wanted to make a sci-fi film. And after Star Wars came out, then everything was just bombarded. Yeah. Oh, just tons of garbage. But my favorite, my some of my guilty favorite Star Wars ripoffs. If you guys are out to write these ones down, is um, Star Crash with Stella Star. It's um, I love that Italian, movie. That's an Italian. <laughs> it's it's such a great movie. It's so that, it's so bad and good at the same time. It is horrible. It David Hasselhoff. That. Oh. And then oh, another another one another favorite one is uh, Message from Space. That was the Japanese answer to Star Wars. And that's basically um, Seven Samurai. It was a remake of Seven Samurai. Oh, I gotta or, look that up. Yeah, a message from space. So these aliens um, are being overtaken by this evil empire. So they make these magical walnuts. They throw them out into space to find these warriors that draws them together. Yeah, it's 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 <laughs> so wacky. But the production value and these costumes and the stage present and all these models on wires in unison flying through space. It's just yeah, it's it's amazing. You guys can. Oh. Gotta see it. Message, message from space. That's a great one. I, I just found it. I'm gonna annoy my wife tonight, and I'm going to watch it. It's on Tubi for free. Oh, so, you guys, I just pulled it up too. Yeah, strap it up, guys. Strap in. It's <laughs> it's so good. You are not going to be disappointed. So so, oh, a good friend of ours is in the chat right now, Lupe. Um, he he shouted out Ice Pirates, which I have to admit. Here's, <laughs> a, here's the, again, Ice Pirates is just it's 
I love the concept of it, yeah. but it's it's just bad. It's like <laughs> I, I understand what they're trying to do, but even when I was a kid in the theater, like going, can we just stop talking and start fighting or going to space? It's a, yeah. it's, it's, it's a big snooze fest for as much as they put into it and have a great cast. There's a great cast in it and great stuff. It suffers low budget. They shoot in parking lots. You can tell like it's it's yeah, it's really cheap. They like, yeah. Was, <laughs> some like people something. Yeah, people Keenan some people watch over and over. Yeah, I, I, I have to say no to space I spy. It's sorry, <laughs> you know Can't when I was a kid, it was it would play a lot on uh, over here it was channel five KTLA. Oh yeah, channel anytime, right. yeah, anytime it came on, I was watching it. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 things that pull you in, but yeah, yeah, don't forget don't forget space herpes and all that stuff. Oh yeah. <laughs> And not forget about space herpes. You know, it's funny hearing you talk about that Darth Vader mask and how it was never perfect, but then you look at the old casts of the original and it's completely like uh lopsided and none of the sides oh, are guys, matching don't up. Get, yeah. It, no, what what's what's different is because back in the days when we were working um everything's digital now. So when I worked at the prop house, they were super anal about everything being precise and super clean or whatnot. And um uh <laughs> and but the other thing too is that um you could get away with murder because it was shown on film you could get away with murder with film and digital changed everything and uh robocop um i worked at a shop called precision effects and they were making robocop 2 at the time and i was working out here and we had uh, a possibility because um they were doing this thing robocop and botin was slammed the shop because they're making they're making robocop and he need a bunch of stunt suits because there'd be more stunts in this new. They had more money, more stunts. So he needs stunt suits. So the, the suits were shipped to the shop for us to look at because they want us to clean them up and remold them and make like five suits or something like that. And my boss at the time was like, Mike, and he looked at me and he said, look, he goes, I normally would jump all over this just so I could have a mold to so could cast one for myself down the road. But he said that the turnaround time they wanted so fast for these suits he just knew it was not possible. He's like, I can't, we can't do it. Uh, and we're like, oh, so we had to pack them back up. But I will tell you one thing. When I saw these suits, these are suit. This was the original RoboCop suit. And you look at it up close. It had tool marks and rake marks from when they were sculpting it in clay. Oh. It's like, and just, just a, a, the fins on the bottom, the ribs are all uneven. Nothing's symmetrical. It's all jacked, but you don't see it. When you watch the movie, he looks amazing. And that's one thing about it. You were able to get away with that stuff. You look at it. When I saw it up close, I'm like, wow, this this got this this was shot on film. And it became an iconic costume. And it's that whole thing you shut you couldn't use that costume on digital by today's standards. So yeah. well, the old days of just getting things away. Yeah, it's like things were more forgiving back then. Yeah. So so Ted, you uh you lived where did you grow up again? It was in uh, uh, St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis? St. Yeah, I grew, oh, I grew, oh, in the Midwest. God. Missouri. Yeah. Oh, you know this guy's highest crime city. I saw we just we, we got number one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, for for me and David, it brings when we hear Missouri, it brings very painful memories. Yeah. Memories. Yeah. Uh oh, you guys what, what you guys were stationed out there? We, we went to uh, basic training and AIT yeah. out there. Oh, I'm sorry. We're both MPs by trade. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's funny because I grew up a Rams fan, and uh, by the time I got to basic, they were in St. Louis already. And I was like, oh, I'll go catch a game. I found out how far away it was, and I was like, yeah, never mind. That's too far. I'm going to get caught up by the drill sergeants. I'm going to get destroyed. Well, yeah. like I tell people, at the time when I was a kid growing up, it was a great place to be raised. I, I, like, I, didn't, I liked growing up there, but so if you want to do or grow or change – not just St. Louis, but anywhere for you're from is that if you want to get out of the rut or do something, you've got to move or go where the action is or go. And for me, when I um, came out to LA, it was my whole purpose was to come out and work in the entertainment industry. I always tell people, don't move. I, I'm the first one to tell you this. Don't move to LA unless you want to work in the industry. Cause there's no other reason to live here. It's, yep. it's, it's overpriced. It's parking's horrible. Traffic's horrible. It's, it's not the place to live. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm gotten for punishment. I love it here, but I've been here. And I, I don't know. I know. I know my way around how to manipulate my way through this beast, but it takes years living here to understand that. But yeah, I don't recommend it to everybody. It's not, not for everybody. 
But see, I grew up in a small town in central California and it was just surrounded by farmlands and stuff like that. So I had to do the same thing. I had to move to San Diego to get away from home, like go to school, do my art thing. Right. And then pandemic forced us back. So I'm back in Fresno now, but it's like, yeah, I I miss living in Southern California. I miss the big cities. I don't, I don't really partake to being home anymore. Understandable. So (laughs) for you, Yes, sir. Moving out of St. Louis, you came over here to LA. What was the very first project that you actually got in on? Miracle Landing with Connie Selica. It was a made for TV movie. There was a name. I, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, dude, she was, she was, I mean, I think she was still kind of pulling a draw there at the time. Yeah. She was not, she was kind of coming down from that peak. But um, we made this, it turned out it's a, it's a true story about the Aloha tragedy. It was about, a lot of you people don't know this. There was an American Aloha Airlines that were flying, and there was a, a crack in the fuselage of the airplane, and the entire top of the plane peeled open like a banana skin. Just went, Jeez. and it had one casualty. It was a flight attendant. She went, Pew! she was gone. Everybody else was seat belted, and the pilot did a nose dive that dropped the altitude, so there was oxygen because all the oxygen masks were gone, and there was no air. So he did right. emergency, he did emergency descent. Leveled out, and the plane was twisting like this while he was flying because oh there's no stability God. in it. And he he landed the plane, and and everybody survived. Jeez. Jesus. But anyway, so they made it made for TV movie about that. So I was part of the visual effects crew, and uh, I was one of the model makers. And we came on board and built all this. We built these giant um, miniatures of the airplane fuselage, and we shot the stuff in high speed, and we had it rip open. And we shot it on a thing so they could rear screen projection it so the actors could be in chairs and you could see it happening. <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 it was pretty cool. And that was one of my first things, and it was I learned so much. That was my first, that was one job of many, but that was what got me started. That's crazy. So sorry. Ghost, great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um so you moved, you went to that and then you moved into what was your next project? Cause I mean, let's hear about the, let's hear the story of Ted. Well, what I'll tell you what, I can, I can kind of condense it cause it goes on for a long time. But what it was is that I got, I got into miniature making. What happened was I, I came out here with the illusion that I was going to be a makeup artist. I'm like, I loved monster movies. I loved American Werewolf in London. Oh yeah. I loved, I loved Rick Baker. I got all those, I got all the Cinefax magazines that I read about Rick Baker I learned a lot about them through a magazine called Starlog and oh, famous Starlog. monsters. Yeah. Famous monsters of film land and Fangoria. Uh, yeah, yeah. All Fangoria stuff. So I was, just, I was eating that stuff up. So I had all these books and alien and all this stuff. And so when it came to California, I'm like, well, I, the miracle of anything was a model job. Like, well, I could do models. It's like, I, I grew up as a kid making models. So I understood the concept. And so I got schooled in model. I learned a little bit more about it. I started model making, so I started wanting to get into makeup. So I hooked up with Steve Wang, and when he did the Giver, which was nothing but makeup, it was makeup and monsters, and I was working on it, but I was still young and apprentice, so I was kind of in the shop. And here's a story for you. I worked for Screen Red George and had a big shop, and I would just do jobs they had signed me to, and I was just kind of learning as I was going. And I was getting paid 50 bucks a day. What? <laughs> that was my rate. Jesus. <laughs> But you know what's so funny about it? I was I was a kid in the valley. And my apartment was like four hundred and fifty bucks. Oh my gosh! And, and at fifty bucks, I was like, and I lived on like ramen and you know noodles and mac and cheese, and like I was able to. I look back on that. I could. It was just me, you know. I was surviving, so and I loved it. And eventually, I'm like, okay. So as we were working on the movie, Steve liked me i worked when we did kung fu rascals his movie i played i played multiple characters i played a lot of monsters and he really liked the way i projected how i moved or acted in these monster suits so when i got on guyver they cast me to play um striker so jj walker was an actor but he was a zonoid for all you fans out there zonoids are guys that turn into monsters like a werewolf you know so jj would turn into a monster and that's when i would take over and it was a blast because i was just in this crazy giant lizard costume and I was overacting and moving around and doing and just trying to try to embody JJ Walker with his, with his walk and being, you know, 
and it was a big hit. And so when the movie came out, Fangoria wrote an article and gave JJ Walker a great nod at how great he was in the monster suit. <laughs> I always wondered about that. Like, how was that dude in the suit? Like, there's no way he was already a little bit older at the time. And people uh, were like, oh, yeah, yeah. And so I thought so funny because I, I got screwed over from the credits of that movie. I, it was a whole acting union thing. I got kind of screwed out of it. But the whole point was over now with social media and over the years, I could post about it and talk about it. And that's some people are like, what? That was you. So, yeah, it was kind of, yeah so it's it was fun. But um, so the long story short was I was working in the shop and I was next to this kid named Eddie Yang. Eddie Yang's a real, a, 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 an accomplished makeup artist now. And I was working with him. He made the character Lisker, the big, the big rhino looking guy with a big ram head. That was Lisker. And Eddie Yang was 17 years old. And I'm working next to Eddie Yang. And he grabs some clay and he goes, <laughs> and he starts throwing clay on this head cast, right? And by the time lunchtime comes around, he had the thing blocked out. Get it blocked out and when i looked at it I said dude that would take me a week and he did it in hours wow. and, so, and then he stands wow. there and he goes oh yeah i'm just gonna let that set up and i'm gonna go back and add details later you know i'm like oh and i realized this is I, I, I'm, I'm way out of my league it's like <laughs> he did that with real clay i can barely do it in zbrush <laughs> and it it, and it it humbled me too because I, I realized as much as i liked i had i had like wanted to do something that's not, I said, I, but as I was working around these guys, the one thing I was good at was fabricating and like, like the Giver unit thing, like I was more of a model maker and I had ideas of how to make the things open and close and like, and, and Steve's like, yeah, 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 I did, I do that. And so everybody else in the shop wasn't really, couldn't really grasp, put their head around it, but I could. So that's what I kind of found. I was more of a builder and fabricator and stuff. So I was kind of like, got away from, from sculpting, got more into like miniatures and then, then later became, uh, costumes and then went from costumes to props. So I changed my life, my career three times. So I was a visual effects, doing miniatures, went from miniatures to, to suits and creatures and, and making suits and then fell into miniature and then doing props. So it's about the first five, six, seven years and then changed gears and then was a model maker for like 15 years and spent the last like 30 or like, you know, like 20 like doing props. So I'm pretty multifaceted in most of that stuff. So what got you into doing your actual YouTube channel? Because I, um, I, I saw that and I obviously, you know, that's what I got first hooked on. And then I saw that there was a huge gap between your first, I think it was like a few episodes and then the next post. Yeah. Um, what happened was um, I uh, was working at the prop house. And I was there for like uh, what I felt like, like I really, I really thought I was there for five years. And then when I left the shop, it turned out I was there for 15. Oh, geez. I, I spent I a couple of jobs like that. Right. It's a good time. <laughs> jeez. And it really freaked me out. I was like, holy cow. Because it, I, that place, again, when I talk about this place, this, this is, this is most every shop you work at. It's a factory and you have to work quickly. And, have to, and so it's, it, there, it was just neck breaking pace. And it went from when I first started there, we had like, like a week or two, we usually had like a month to build something and it turned to weeks. And then by the time I left, it was days, just the industry and everything kept, but every, everything, kept, the prices got higher, everything, they want to pay us less and want everything faster. So by the time I left, it was just the level of speed. I was done. I was burned out. And so uh, my buddy Chuck one day, who was the, uh, was my shop foreman at the time. And Chuck was kind of like, we became friends because I woke up and had coffee with this guy every day for 15 years and we were friends. And he came in one day and said, ah, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to take my wife and I, we're going to go back home, you know, to Philadelphia, I'm getting out of here. And I was, I, I looked at him and went, Oh my God, if he leaves, I'm leaving because he was the one that kept me, you know, on track and kept me away from my bosses, you know, dealing with those guys is kind of a pain. So he's like, he was my mediator between those guys. And if he left, then I have to deal with them directly. I don't want to do that. So, when Chuck gave his final notice, literally the next day I came in and said, I'm, I'm going to. So I left. And that was the time when uh, the YouTube thing was kind of starting off. And I thought, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take this opportunity and dedicate my time to YouTube full time. And I did. And I started like in 2014, I think, or something like that when I started. 
And I did it pretty steadily as nine years, almost nine years straight as a career. I did that YouTube. I went to conventions. I ran it. It was doing really great. Then COVID came, derailed everything. And then Putin's war started. And then everything doubled the prices. And so now I'm at the point where I'm, I still have my YouTube channel. And I'll tell you guys out there, thank you so much for watching my channel and subscribing. Be patient with me. I am coming back. Uh, leveling back up, I had to go back to work for a little bit of a while and go back into movie industry stuff. So I'm doing movie work a little bit on the side. Because um, what happens when I do movie work, it, it it takes all my time. Like they work you hard and long, so I don't have any time. So now I'm getting back in the groove of getting back to my YouTube channel. So I just got my um, my space helmet video, which I've been waiting to do for a long time. When that video is up and I got a new one going coming up and I got a, 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 a bolter pistol for more hammer I'm working on next. So I have videos coming by I can't wait for that. I, I've recently started kind of dabbling in Warhammer and and uh oh man. Yeah, that, I, that. It's fun stuff. So I had a quick question. I, I know we talked a lot about Guyver and uh but you worked on the fifth element too. And what what were your like keynotes on that? Oh my gosh, that I was enjoyed, a... I love that movie. That film was a roller coaster because when we got that job, uh, Luc Besson was shooting it in France, and he wanted to do it, but he wouldn't do everything in France. Uh, I'm sorry, in England. He's doing it in UK. It was, England, it, was, it was overseas production. He goes, I want to do everything here. And then the visual effects guys, are, but yeah, but our shops are here in LA. We're going to do everything out here. So, but okay, okay. So we got it. And when we got the show, they were shooting in, in England, and we were doing all the miniatures. And, uh, we had great production designs and drawings and artwork and stuff, but um, I was on I was on board with the the flying cab, so I was part of the crew of the flying cab, and we had pictures, of blueprints of the cab, and we're looking at the model like they're looking at shots. We had some images from the movie, and we actually had the blueprints, and we're looking at the blueprints, looking at the model, and go these don't, this doesn't look right. They look kind of different, like. So we call the guys in England. They're like, "Hey, what's up?" They go, "Oh yeah, yeah. We didn't really follow the blueprints. We just kind of made it or, like organically." And we're like, "Oh great, okay." So we're like, well, "We have to build this thing. It has to match verbatim. Has to look exactly." So my boss, Leslie Eckert, gets on a plane, flies to London, and he makes this big yardstick with a grid on it. Meaning it's just black and white with dots and lines. It was to represent inches and feet. And he worked and we went to the full size cab and he would place it and photograph it all these different angles. And man, when he came back, he had these beautiful photographs of the full size cab and, he, and being a model maker, he knew what he was doing. So he knew sure. all the angles that we needed. So we literally built from the photographs. We had a general idea of, of the length, but we actually built from the photographs. And so my favorite shots in that movie is when Corbin Dallas pulls out of the garage and he opens the garage. And so you see him getting the cab and all that stuff. That's all full size. And as soon as you see the cab hovering, any shot where you see the whole cab hovering, it's the model. And the, the cab starts to push out and somebody runs and he has to, he kind of hits the brake lights and it's back. Yeah, the car goes, Ooh, it hurts. That's our model. And we like, we're on top of it. You see it in 70 millimeter on the screen. And it, it was so beautiful because I was sitting there like, Oh my god, it looks it looks so much like it. So every time you saw the model floating or independently floating around, it was always the model. And so the few shots we see the actors was the full size one. That's awesome. Yeah, that is awesome because that's like one of my favorite shots of the whole movie is like that whole taxi scene at the beginning, and the chick falls through. I mean, uh, Mila Jovovich, right? She falls through the ceiling, and you know, Lilo Dallas multipass like feel like <laughs> there, There's a quick shot in the film because we had this. Here's the so we had to work so quickly. These models were painted and completed, and and this is the old days, where you always had to have different mounts for the for the car. So the mount for the cab when it's flying forward, you had a mount in the back, and then when it's flying, you had a mount for the side, you had a mount way to take it. So the cab, when it goes out the garage, like we had to, I had to, there was no place to hide the mount. They cut the, it was like there's a license. It has like he has a slight indentation of his of his license plate on the cab. And so that's where I cut out the hole for the mat. I had to make bond, I had to make a little patch up and make a little bondo thing around it. So it, was, it fit in perfectly. And the only way you could get it in was using a piece of tape because when it snapped in, you couldn't grab it to get it out. So you had to take a piece of tape and fold it in half and grab it and pull it out with a piece of tape wow. because 
You couldn't get it out otherwise. But in the movie, when he pulls forward, that was always made me nervous because you're going to see the seam line, and you didn't. It was perfect. Um, but in the shot where she falls and goes through it, we had to make a hole. So these models are done, and like he's like, Ted, we got to cut a hole in the cab and make it to where it's a hole. It's got to look like folded metal, but it can't move because it's, it's a model. Right. So like, oh, crap. So I had to cut a hole in it, and I took black wrap foil and shaped it and then put clay behind it and made a silicone mold of that so I could reproduce the torn hole. And I had to do two cabs like that. So I had to cut it and patch it. And the guys, I would do it, finish it, and the guys would come in and paint it. And my friend at the time, Brian Ripley, made a Barbie doll and he painted her up like Lee Lou Dallas and put her in the cab. So the only shot in the film where you actually see it is an overhead shot where Carmen Dallas is there and she falls in the cab and the cops surround them. Right. And, and there's all, it's a big overhead shot of the, and you see the, the cab and the cops surrounding him before he punches and goes down. So it's right. a quick shot. And if you, and you freeze the DVD, you can see, a, you might, you can look in a little, you can see maybe a little bit of her. So <laughs> that's cool. Because but they're like, we might, we might see in there. We might see Brian we made this, took a Barbie doll and bent her up and painted her like Lila and stuck her in there. It's funny. Oh, that's oh. awesome. Uh, I, I need to interject real quick, Ted. I apologize. I am unfortunately going to have to uh, step out a little bit early, but I did have one question for you. Um, oh talk a little bit about, uh, you know, your, your early days in the, in the industry and, and, you know, the things you've been working on more recently. Um, practical versus uh, CGI. What are, what are your thoughts? Um, it, it's a double-edged sword because you could, it's, it's like, I always tell people it's a great tool. It's like a hammer but you can't do everything with a hammer. Right. So, and it's, um, I think CG is g grown so much. The stuff where digital is the best, I think is the most groundbreaking stuff. Like when you watch Mando or the new, what's that new, uh, Andor, Andor series. Yeah. yeah. Where these guys walk out on location, there's a spaceship behind them. It looks like it's there and yeah. we all know it's not there. But it looks so – like they build a section of it and then everything else they do in post, but it's so groundbreaking. When it gets to organic stuff and people, it's still – you know, the only person that's able to pull that off is James Cameron for the Avatar movies. I mean, that's the level of like motion. Like, But anything with actors or monsters, like we always can spot it. It's like you always can spot it. But, oh, of course. But when it's, when it's just – I think digital is so great for building landscapes – and buildings and green screens like having the actors at some place and then going beyond that and not being a matte painting because now you can do a digital matte painting and the camera can move and tilt and move and like they have all this freedom now that's why i think digital is really amazing and also digital literally literally obliterated model making people like it, going oh people are like oh it'll come back and the answer is this is no yeah literally, i mean it, it is not, not that. coming back people it's not yeah no, the per perfect example of that was Jurassic Park. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that was probably like the most obvious, you know, because Rick Baker was working on the, the physical, actual dinosaur. And this was actually something my, my older brother, as Eugene mentioned, he did work in the industry for a period of time. Um, and, and he was on it for the project. And these guys came over to his workshop and said, hey, we need a couple of extra pairs of hands over here. Can you come over? And they walk in. And there's this T-Rex, you know, full, full size, full scale T-Rex that probably never really saw the light of day. <laughs> well, I mean, it did, it saw, it did in, in shots what came down and bumped things. Yeah. Like, they were able to use some of it, but um, you're absolutely right. It was It was so that I was at the theater and those makeup guys I was talking about earlier, I worked with on, on the Guyver movie. They were with me when the theater, we saw Jurassic Park. Yeah. You should, you should have seen the look on their faces. We came out of that theater and they looked at us and like, my career is over. I'm over. My career is over. It's done. It's like, and everybody this look of panic. And I looked at him and said, dude, you know what it cost? This is Spielberg. This is not some any guy. This is Spielberg pushed the envelope with George Lucas and ILM doing the ultimate of what they can do. And it's going to cost a fortune. And it did. And it, it, it's affordable now. But I'm trying to say it takes a while. But the, the one thing which I know everybody's talking about, and it's going to happen is that you think that's amazing. AI is, is going to change 
visual effects in the sense of like it can like the, I haven't I heard so much about it haven't seen it but the new Indiana Jones movie there's a scene where Harrison Ford plays Indy a younger version of him in the movie and it got ILM and they took all the footage and stuff of of Harrison Ford from his 30s and, and, and superimposed it and what they did was the machine took him like Harrison Ford goes it just took him AI did and rebuilt just put him on top of him yep. so it's not it's not dig, it, here's the thing it's not digitally created they didn't create it digitally it actually took footage of him and manipulated it onto him so you can't get any more real than that that's what AI does and so it's like that's groundbreaking granted I probably won't see the movie because I, I it just sounds terrible but <laughs> the trailer yeah. looks amazing that that particular scene you're talking about you actually see it for a brief moment and it does look amazing yeah. yeah, you know that's the that's the sad thing is that we when we watch these trailers. Okay, Dennis, <laughs> see, you, we'll see you later. Ted, we really appreciate you taking the time, guys. I will see you next week, and and again, everybody, thank you for watching. Ted, thank you again. Appreciate it. Thank you, man. All right, thank Dennis, you. I'll see you later. So, the sad thing is, is that when we see these new trailers, it's like we see the best. And like you said, I'm probably not going to go see it because yeah, I just saw the best parts of it all. It's, yeah, it's and like, tagging yeah, on to uh, what Dennis said before he left, like I think the best CGI is only done well when the practical effects exist in the same movie because right. together the movies are amazing. But yeah. when they have too much of one and not enough of the other, you can definitely see the shortcomings in those films. Yeah, and, and they rely too much on it too. It takes. It's like just get working the story, guys, and the scripts. Yeah, the thing is, my I think like all of us, and I'll, I'm, I'll I'll get in my soapbox for a really short bit here about the whole Indiana Jones thing is that people um, like the Disney thing. It's about marketing and trying to reboot a franchise. It's like just just wrap up the character. Let let Indy just make a show where you wrap up Indy and let it be. But yeah. they're like, no, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do this thing like we did with Star Wars. We're gonna try to introduce these new people. And you ready for this? Nobody cares, man. You, you're gonna try it, and nobody cares. And not saying that this actress is not worthy or anything like that. It's just, it's a bad thing. It's bad timing. No matter what you do or how many spins you're gonna put on it, it's not Indiana Jones. We all love Indy. It's like, and so when Indy goes, we're done. Nobody cares about this new person that's gonna take on his adventures. We don't care. And like there was that whole big thing, which I think was a, an epic failure, which I don't think it's a, even a real thing. I think Kathleen Kennedy just said it to get people riled up. But she's like, oh, we're bringing Ray back for this whole new Star Wars thing. And, oh, yeah. And, and it's, dude, there's no script. There's no production on it. She just said it to rile people up. And I'm telling you right now, it's not going to happen because nobody cares. It's like, no, nobody does. It's like, it, it, it's when the, it, they lost a lot of money with this new trilogy and then nobody cares about the franchise. We all love the old stuff. We love Mando. We love Boba Fett. We like Ahsoka. Like we like all the stuff from this other past stuff, but even the new stuff we're done. And it's just like this, this whole desperate attempt. And yeah, it's like, I knew it was a little bit of a fanfare. And I said, it's, it, it what's the old saying? Proofs in the pudding. If it doesn't sell, it's not going to happen, and it's not going to sell. No, you can't get people on board with that. Just... Definitely. So, who is somebody that you've kind of, I guess, looked up to yourself? Did and have you had a chance to meet them, or is there somebody that you've met that you've just like me fanboyed out over because you're like, oh my gosh, I'm with this person right here. Uh, you're so funny. I've never. I'm always. I've bumped and ran into somebody so. <laughs> So many celebrities have been around them that I've, I've never idolized people. I always admired them, but I've never fangirled so much. Um, but I did. Um, <clears throat> I met Adam Savage uh, twice now, and um, we really hit it off. And I was at Silicon, and oh, I was at Silicon, and it was a convention he ran. It was last year, I think it was. It was last year, and I just recently did a low budget sci fi film for my friend called Space Wars. Hmm. And I built control panels in the space suit. Oh, look, I mean, I, I even have it right here. Actually. It's like, I made this space helmet. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and so I made it, and um, <clears throat> I got it back. And so I went to Silicon, and I gave it to Adam Savage. I thought he could, he'll get a big kick out of this, right? So he absolutely loved it. He made a video about it. 
I'm tested about this helmet. You really like it. So he said, look, Ted, I'd love you to come to the shop. I'm like, oh, my God. So I got invited to go to the shop. But we haven't really, because he's like myself. We're very busy. But that was a, one of the great moments. I get, That was kind of cool to meet somebody who's roughly in the same age range that I am, who's done a lot of the movie industry work stuff. And it's really cool that we both have this, like, kind of YouTube private presence. And it would be, be great to meet him. Um, I'll tell you the biggest guy I've, I have a huge fandom for and mad respect for. And I worked for him um, once. No, twice. Worked for him twice. That's James Cameron. And I worked, the first time I worked with him was on T2 3D, The Ride. Oh, that was an awesome ride. Dude, I wish it was such an awesome ride. And they had it here, they had it here in uh, California. And uh, they put it in Florida, too. And, of course, over time, they just pull the rides because they get old. But yeah. it was such – it was actually – people don't realize this – that it was kind of based on a third concept he had for the movie. Like, that was, like, his idea for the third the third trilogy and the Star, and the um, Terminator franchise. So he just kind of made it as a ride. And <clears throat> I worked with him on that. We met him briefly on that one. <clears throat> and then – God, years, decades later – I worked with him on Titanic and that was another great thing that when it says a James Cameron film, they're not kidding. That guy oversees every shot of that film. He never just says, Oh, like most the reason I say it because films I worked on, I worked on contact, uh, the Jodie Foster sci-fi film, Robert Zemeckis and Zemeckis has a whole bunch of people that do stuff for him. So he directs and goes, I want to, so he had a visual effects team guys and they would go out and do the stuff. And then show it to him. And he'd say, yay, nay, or, uh, you know, and they would just make the shots for him. And, but it was just watching Cameron do every shot in the film from visual, all the, all the stuff. Everything we do was miniatures. There's some digital stuff in the film, but most of the stuff we did with miniatures from that film, all the rooms turning and flooding were giant miniatures being flooded with the room and stuff breaking in half was all giant miniatures. And even the iceberg, the hit and break, it was all this big giant miniature. And they're shooting at stuff and he would watch it and say, I want this. And it was like, and he would see the shots and if something didn't look right, he'd shoot it again. He knew what he was, he knew what he wanted. It was just like that guy oversaw every freaking shot of that film. So, yeah. So I, I, I briefly kind of met him. I would love to sit down and talk to him. I'd be, so I guess he would be the expert. Was there room for Jack on that door? <laughs> <laughs> I would say there was room. It does. It didn't matter. He was submerged so deep. The hypothermia. It's just. It, he, it's so cold. He was blue. I was. I, I mean, he, he, he was. was he was. He was. He was in it too long. It's like yeah. even like she got on it and her, she was a little wet, but he was submerged. And even if he got out, like if he, it's like the whole thing of like if he got on it, it submerged them both, and then they both would freeze. So by him being off it, he had to take the yeah. It's like you know, people. Yeah. Yeah, but thing is, is <clears throat> she loved him. If she truly loved him so much. She would have pulled him on, and they both would have died together. I I only kidding. ask that because it's one of those questions that everybody, every dude who hates Titanic, is like, "Yeah, but if she would have just moved over, they could have both fit." And it's like, well, they neither one of them existed in the actual story, so what's the matter? <laughs> so, yeah, 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 guys. It's, yeah, exactly. It's a love story. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a love story movie, dude. Yeah. So, Ted, I did actually get a chance to watch the movie that you made. Yeah. Get out. I, I dug it up. I, I I was like, I got to watch this movie. Even again, my wife was like, you got to find it because you've got to watch it because he's going to be on your show because yeah. So I did watch it. How did that whole thing come about? I mean, how did you get the opportunity <laughs> to be able to do that? Uh, that's a good story for everybody out there watching this show. The film is called Guardian of the Realm. There's, I know there's bootlegs and things out there. Please don't do that. There's some really <laughs> bad copies of it out there. Um, What were, I, Higher Pictures, the the guys are my friends back in St. Louis. Um, they got, they're both the producers on it. My friend Scott Baker and Bob Clark are friends I knew since high school. And they came into some money. And Bob's like, we should make a movie. So he was with my friend Scott and Scott wanted to make a movie. And so he turned to Scott and said, hey, well, now I got money. Let's make a movie. And Scott's like, ah, tell you what. I know Ted wants to make a movie. He's in California. And he knows people. Let's talk to him. So they called me up and said, hey, do you still want to make a movie? I'm like, what? 
really? So I had this crazy idea for this cyborg movie I wanted to make. And as I started talking about it, I started realizing this is way too big. It's way too expensive. <laughs> so about, you know, this girl walking the wasteland with a mechanical arm and these three cyborgs that killed her mm-hmm. father. And so I was going to, and then after a while, I'm like, oh my God, I can't, I can't do this. So I got to write something small. And so I laugh because what Guardian started off as a small project and turned into a monster on its own. But um, it, yeah, it was a, a, a low budget film that we shot. Um, I was, I learned, I knew generally, I knew what about, about filmmaking from working in the industry for so long as I did, but that you don't really know until you're in the director's seat. And then that's when I started, like, I, li- I literally worked on that film for two years. We got, we got this, we got the script. We wrote, we wrote it, took about a year to write the script. We had a general idea what we wanted. I bashed out the script. My friend Wyatt Weed came on board. We both wrote the script. We wrote the script. I had, I had the idea in my head and then we had to make it into a, a, a story, a three, you know, three story act and all these characters. And so we started writing it finally to where we got it. And then we went into post. <clears throat> so we went into production. So it took me a year, right? So we went to, went to post and then, I convinced the producers. I'm like, dude, all the stuff that has to be built, I can do it. Because in, in the real world, you have to hire people and spend tons of money. And then it's about time and money. So you hired and said, we don't have that luxury. We can't do that. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is, can you guys give me at least nine months? So I, again, everybody, I don't recommend this for anybody. Do not do this. <laughs> so I stood in my loft for nine months and just crank stuff out. I had a couple of friends that would come in periodically and help me out. So for nine months, I was building the costumes, building the props, building the weapons, designing the creatures. I built this character named Tao, the gold demon. I built him. I built the red bad, bad guy at the end. I built him. Uh, the evil demon queen outfit, I built her outfit. So again, we we're just doing all this stuff. And then when it got closer to production, I started bringing extra people in to help me. And then we went into production and we shot it in the can, boom. We did it over like 30 days. The movie shot in 30 days. Right? Crazy. That's fast. Yeah, that's, a, that's a quick shoot. And everybody in low budget world tells, says, that's a long, that's a lot of time, Ted. <laughs> I said, yeah, if you're shooting Star Wars, I mean, it's, like, it's like, are shooting like, um, that's why they shoot normal movies. Usually production's like, please would shoot something in 30 days. I said, it's long for low budget, but it's short for big budgets. And I treated my film like a big budget film. We shot until we got what we needed. And then we basically went in year and we went into post. So then it was editing and effects. And we realized we're out of money. So then I had to get a job. So that's how I found the prop shop that I was at for 15 years. I found the job. I started making money. And then we went back into film. And so it took us about a year to edit the movie. So we're two years in. We get it all done. We do a screening. People love it. And we get it. We're ready. My buddy, why now? We're ready. Yeah, let's go do the film festival. It's going to be great. So as soon as we put the, we sold the film within four months. So by the time it was done, Think Films bought it and they just dumped it. You know, they, like most distributors, they just took it, bought it, didn't advertise it, just threw it out, out there. So it went to Netflix, Hollywood Video, Blockbuster, it was everywhere on the shelves and it kind of went, had its little peak and it disappeared. So my producers... Got the, they're doing the, they got the film back and they're going to uh they, we already did a recut on it we cleaned it all up and we redid all the visual effects my friend Wyatt did he did amazing stuff he, so our plan is to hopefully someday re, re-release this so all you guys out there want to see this uh stay in touch with me on social media or go to my twitter account i uh, go to instagram evil ted underscore channel i'm also on facebook evil ted and you can also go find me on tiktok and uh and also on my website evil and um I will keep you guys posted because I, I know eventually we want to re-release it. But uh, but what did you think of it? What, what honestly? What did you think? <laughs> I you know what? It was really cool to see that you were able to like that you did it that you actually went out there and made your own film, regardless if it was low budget. David always gives me crap because I watch all. I don't care whether it's low budget, big budget. I watch I, it all. I, I do. I do the same thing. I do. I, and honestly, every movie has something in it that is still it's a little chunk of gold in it that i like and yeah the acting wasn't the greatest but i thought it was really like the makeup that was done on just that first the first demon 
you know, the girl with the, 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 it almost reminded me of lost boys, the way her face. Yeah. It's, it's basically, yeah, it's, I, I, it's, it's the, I'll be honest. That's all the Buffy brow. I call it. I stole that. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I sat there and I watched it and it was fun. It was a fun movie to watch. Thank I you. wish I had more people with me because it, you know, obviously a movie like that is also fun to, to be talking about as you're watching it. And so it was really cool. And I did notice, and I, I, I wanted to ask, was the control console that, what was her name? The, the young girl that liked Lisa, Lisa. Yeah. Was that panel from Star Trek next generation? No, it was inspired by it. Oh, okay. Cause I, I love the, I love the look and I wanted yeah. that look. So my friend, Matt Munson made that for me. He did, he did the, I said, think next gen. I want like next gen, but wait. Yeah. And so, yeah. And we didn't, so I did it. We pumped light underneath it, did the same thing they did next generation. Cause I, I wanted, I wanted to, touch keypad stuff. I wanted everything high tech. So, and, and I thought it was really cool. That was the one thing it stood out to me. I was like, man, that kind of looks like next yeah. generation, but it was, yeah, cool. I, I, I built that damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty sweet. So, yeah, I mean, it was, it was awesome to be able to watch the movie and luckily, I, I mean, I just found it. I was like, where can I find this to watch this? Where, where did you find it? Where'd you find it? It's on YouTube. Of course it is. <laughs> Somebody, it, it wasn't the greatest quality. That's the, thing, that's the thing is because it's so good when the quality is great on it. It's such a, I tell these people, people want to watch it. <clears throat> Cause I just recently, we just did, we just recut it. We remastered it. It's like a completely different movie. It looks so great. So a lot of the effects and stuff we do suffer because you can't see them. So yeah. on the, and on the, and the burn thing, yeah, it's, it's terrible. So, and that's, that was like one of the things that I, when I, when you burn, they burn the, the first demon and then as they were burning, they just look, it looked kind of bad, but I also knew that it was because it was a YouTube you know, somebody just kind of put it up on YouTube and it was not full digital and everything. So I'd love to see, you know, another version of it. And I, you know, cause are, are you, are you local? You're on here, right? Oh yeah. I'm, I'm over in Montclair. I'm not even that far from you. All right. Well, someday what we'll do, we'll sit down. We'll, I'll show you the new cut. Definitely. would love All right. that. All right. We're going to have to check that out. I'm going to drive yeah. down. You, dude, you're not going to go check it out. Don't lie. I'll drive Don't down. <laughs> So, you know what, Ted, we've, we've kept you on for a while and I, and I definitely want to keep talking. I'd want to keep going on, but I, I don't want to take too much more of your time. We definitely would love to have you back on the show again, if you'd be up for that. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely see what we'll see. What, yeah. We'll see what's coming on. Uh, let you guys know what's going on. Um, if you kids are out there watching, you want to know where to find me, you can definitely go to my website, eviltedsmith.com. I also have a YouTube channel called the evil Ted channel and my main mission is to take the intimidation out of building. I want to get kids. I want to get, that was the whole thing is I worked in the industry for so long. I learned so much stuff that I want. Cause when I did stuff in the beginning, it was all trial and error and you screw things up and you burn through stuff. So I want to take that, that struggle you guys have and take it away from watching my videos. You guys watch my tutorials. You can, I'll teach you all the stuff that I learned on how to build and craft and stuff and do things with foam you can make anything on, on such a relatively budget. Just making movie quality props on just EVA foam. There's really great ways and techniques, and I have all these videos that cover all this stuff on it. So please, guys, if you want to be a maker and dabble, build your own stuff, I'm your gateway drug. So <laughs> definitely, you guys, check him out, Ted. Like I said, your first vi the first video I watched of you, which was the helmet. Yeah. So I like, literally made that helmet right <laughs> after I, I I watched it and I was like, crap, I got to rewind. Okay. What do you do? Okay. Okay. I step by step, I made that helmet and that was my gateway into this whole thing. And then I went out, bought the Dremel, bought the, I mean, I had the whole gamut of tools. David will attest that uh, when I was out overseas, my, my little, we call it our jerk shacks, right. which yeah. It's, it's our little covered area that right. had our bed and everything because it, it was a big old room and we had four guys but i had my little table up against one of the walls i had all my foam right there i mean i i just spent hours inside when i wasn't having to go do our wonderful work that we did out there right and uh but it was because of you and i mean i i would love to pick your brain and you know do more i i I'll send you some I, pictures. I, and I, I tell everybody on social media, guys. I, if you guys have any questions about what I want to do, definitely reach out to me. I answer all my. I'm one of those crazy guys who answers. If you DM me on Instagram or message me on 
uh, YouTube or leave comments. I always engage, I always write to people. And so please, if you have any questions, reach out to me. Guys, it's been a blast. Um, we geeking out some, sometimes we can do this sometime. And we don't have to record it. We can actually just hang out sometime. And we'll catch oh, yeah, up. Yeah, no. Bye. We'll do this. All right, guys. For sure. So Ted, if you just sit tight just for a few minutes. Yep. Um, and Cause I know you had some other questions that about more of this stuff. So sit tight. We're going to just end our show and then we'll be right back with you. All right, guys. Thank you.